Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks for those very interesting comments on the history and different models of open access publishing. I'm not a scientist, so it was very interesting to see how, how scientists do it. It's very different from how lawyers do it. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm actually going to spend a couple minutes talking about um, open, open access public, publication in, a, in legal scholarship. Um, there's some similarities, uh, but actually a lot of differences, and maybe they're instructive and perhaps could cause us to kind of meditate a little bit on how open access might work in disciplines other than those with kind of extremely high production costs and lots of, lots of funding. Mm -hmm. So um, legal scholarship is really kind of a natural candidate for open access publishing, I think. Um, as Jessica Littman, a uh, legal scholar, pointed out some time ago, um, the economics of uh, legal publication uh, really seem to strongly favor open access uh, publishing. Um, in fact, uh, so primarily because the materials produced by authors who have little or no interest in uh, the copyright in the material and no particular interest in uh, receiving a financial return from what they're producing. Um, moreover, uh, law journals are predominantly published by law schools uh, and uh, edited and uh, annotated and reviewed by law students, um, so uh, not peer-reviewed as they are in, in many other fields. Um, there are some peer-reviewed journals, but those are generally peer-reviewed by people within the field or by um, advanced law students at little or no significant expense. So the actual production of the scholarship is extremely inexpensive. In, in fact, kind of essentially the, the costs are internalized by the institutions. Um, and law journals have, histor have historically been distributed at relatively low expense as well. Um, the subscriptions don't cost you know, thousands of dollars the way they do in other fields. They were still kind of expensive, but not terribly expensive. Um, and in fact, um, we've seen a move, a very explicit move on the part of a lot of uh, law librarians uh, toward encouraging uh, open access publication across the board in the legal field. In fact, uh, in November 2008, the directors of the law libraries of uh, University of Chicago, Columbia, Cornell, Duke, Georgetown, Harvard, Northwestern, Pennsylvania, Stanford, Texas, and Yale met in uh, Durham, North Carolina at Duke Law School and uh, drafted the what was they referred to as a Durham Statement on Open Access to Legal Scholarship, which called for kind of two uh, key things. Uh, first, open access publication of all law school published journals, which is really the, the overwhelming majority of them, 95% or more. Um, and, an, and an end to the print publication of law journals entirely, coupled with a commitment to keeping electronic versions available in stable, open, digital formats. Um, and really the only reason that this hasn't happened, I think, already uh, is, is inertia. Um, I like to say lawyers are 100% in favor of progress and 1,000% against change. Um, <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so while everything about legal scholarship suggests a really strong affinity and sort of economic um, sort of affinity, I guess, to open access publication. I still think it's going to take a while just because people aren't used to it yet. You know, the idea of not uh, producing print journals. Uh, if anyone's more opposed to change than law professors, it's law students um, <laughs> who can't handle anything being different. So uh, frankly, at this point, as um, uh, from my perspective, I mean, I see the, the publication of print law journals as a total waste of paper. Um, I'm not aware of anyone who uses uh, print Public, published print versions of law journals for anything other than placing in a uh, in a glass cabinet at their home institution to show that they published an article, um, <laughs> and we could you know easily accomplish that with like a Lulu type service where you know you get your one copy and you can put it in your office and show it off to people. Um, but really, there's not really much need for more than that. Um, so r really, at this point, sort of the distribution of legal scholarship is really a split between three different uh, sort of venues. So we've got a, a certain number of op open access portals, which I'll, I'll describe, describe really quickly, because I think they're interestingly different, and in some ways less useful, but in, in some ways easier 
um, than some of the, mm -hmm. the portals that you describe. Mm -hmm. um, commercial databases, uh, which are still very expensive, um, but for various reasons, the expense is not uh, apparent to many academics. Um, and uh, university presses that produce books and monographs and that sort of thing, um, which is a within legal scholarship, I think a relatively smaller subset of how a scholarship is produced and disseminated, and usually goes to sort of people, well, frequently goes to either very specialized like works in, in history, or um, or to books intended for sort of like more of like a public intellectual mass audience. Um, so re recent developments really have only increased the importance of uh, open access, access publishing to, to legal scholarship. Um, there's really kind of two primary open access databases that uh, are used for legal publications. Um, the biggest, I think, is probably SSRN, or the Social Science Research Network. Um, and the other is Berkeley Electronic Press. And they're, scholars kind of use the two in slightly different ways. So um, SSRN, which was founded in, in 1995, consists of uh, an electronic paper collection that includes about 500,000 complete uh, academic papers. And sort of the, the new institutional norm among law professors is at some point in the article production process, uh, scholars will upload whatever their scholarship is, sometimes as they send it out for review by law reviews, mm -hmm. sometimes after it's been accepted and they have a final edited version. But in any case, before the law journals themselves ever publish the article, they're available for free to the entire interested community on SSRN. And that's, at this point, really how most scholars see, I think, new scholarship, right? SSRN produced clipping services that circulate to people who work in those fields. And so by the time the law journal actually publishes uh, a, a, an article, it's really old hat. Um, so, you know, they serve more like an archiving function, and ultimately the, the materials published by the law journals are incorporated into Lexis, Westlaw, Bloomberg, those kinds of services, so that they become available in sort of a reference fashion to people who are looking for them. But for the people working in the fields themselves, they know and they see the articles coming out in a much more real time fashion. Um, and then BE Press or Berkeley Electronic Press, which is the other large open access uh, portal, which was founded in 1999. Um, it includes a very large archive of articles. In my experience, it tends not to be used as extensively by scholars in the field. I'm not sure exactly why that is. Um, but it is the way that people electronically submit their articles to law reviews. And unlike in other fields where you, know, you send to one journal and they review it and it takes a long time, in the legal publishing world, you send your article to 150 different journals. Um, you wait around to see which one bites first, and then you call all the ones that are more prestigious and try to shop your article up the chain. It's a pretty appalling system, actually. Um, and it's only because, uh, for some reason, lawyers and law students are so resistant to change that I think that remains. I mean, it's ridiculously inefficient and creates a lot of potential for bad blood, but that just seems to be the system that's developed. Um, so um, so I, I really just can't see how this won't develop further. I mean, at this point, um, you know, I think that the law journals provide a very useful function in terms of um, preparing articles for publication. The students do a good job of, you know, helping with the footnoting and making sure that articles are, are properly constructed. But I, I really can't see how a, a system like SSRN isn't going to come to dominate uh, the publication of legal scholarship entirely, if it hasn't, if it hasn't really done that already. Um, I, I, I don't see it, however, taking over from the commercial databases, primarily because they offer a kind of value added that a, a pure archiving system like SSRN really doesn't. Um, and I think the, the primary demerits of it, in a sense, are the fact that it's very hard to search the SSRN database for particular articles. Um, so if you know what you're looking for, you can find it, but it's very hard to sort of look for things in general and determine where they might be. Uh, and moreover, there's no hyperlinking capacity. So you know, finding articles based on citations is really not uh, an effective way of using SSRN. Um, unlike the, the commercial databases, which are much more flexible in that way. So there is a kind of value added that they provide, and I think that they will probably continue to remain at least as long as the economic model continues as it is, because the, the cost of those databases is largely hidden 
to the researchers uh, and scholars who are producing legal scholarship because the commercial databases sell kind of a blanket license to schools. And so there's, you, you really don't feel a pain of how expensive it is to, to use them the way the people in private practice would. Um, so I, I suspect that that'll continue much in the same way that it is now. And likewise with academic presses, I think that they serve a different role in some ways than uh, collecting organi uh, databases like SSRN do. So I don't see at this point a whole lot of conflict between the two. What, one area where I do expect to see a flowering, I, I certainly hope to see a flowering of open access publication in legal scholarship is in the area of case books. Um, as it stands, uh, legal case books are produced by law professors, often um, in kind of in collaboration with one another, at great time and expense to themselves, um, and published by uh, a small number of academic publishers, you know, Lexis, Walters, Caroline Academic Press, and then sold to students at what are frankly unconscionable prices um, in the $150 to $200 plus range. Um, and it seems to me that there's very little value added provided by many of those academic publishers. Sorry to say. Um, and I, I don't really see any reason why, from a law professor's standpoint, it isn't more attractive to provide a case book at a much lower cost, i.e. free. Um, and some people have already started doing that. Oh, sorry. So uh, uh, there's a few out there. I know people are producing them now in, in tax and a couple IP survey ones. I personally am going to be starting to teach copyright law in the spring, and I fully intend to make the development of an open access casebook uh, part of my class preparation.